In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Sometimes you get to preach on your favorites, and this beginning of the third chapter of uh, first, the first letter of John is perhaps my favorite epistle verse. And in it, St. John, the disciple Jesus loved, tells us two important things about who we are and who we shall become. The first is, he tells us that we are God's children now. And the fact that this is show, that this is, shows us how much God loves us. The translation we, uh, we read today, see what love the Father has given us. In another translation, it's see what love the Father has lavished upon us. Second, he says that when Jesus returns, we shall be different from how we are today. But we do not yet know what this will be like, what we will be like. But we do know this, that we shall be like Christ. And since we're not very much like Christ now, this means that we shall be transformed. And John suggests that the means of our final transformation will be through encountering Jesus face to face and seeing him as he truly is. There's a lot to unpack here. What does it mean to be a child of God? Now, as opposed to when? The past? The future? What does it mean to become like Christ, even if we don't fully know what that's going to be like? These are not exactly theological questions, questions about the nature of God. The topic is better called sacred anthropology, a Christian interpretation of the nature of human beings. And the nature of human beings is described in many ways throughout the Bible and is not altogether simple. So before turning to the epistle, let's review the other parts of the story. Several important parts are told us in the first three chapters of Genesis. In Genesis 1, God speaks, of all creation, speaks all of creation into being and pronounces everything he created to be good, including human beings, but also the earth and heavens, the plants and animals. But it also says something about us that is not said about any other created thing, that we are created in the image and likeness of God. Now, neither Christian nor Jewish theology interpret this to mean that God has a body that looks like a human body. But there is some fashion in which we share divine qualities. Some have suggested that this is a matter of how our souls have properties that God also has, like the ability to act, reason, will, and love. We are, in short, very special creatures. There's always been some debate about whether the words image and likeness suggest two different things, or whether this is simply an instance of poetic reduplication of language that we often find in Hebrew, and I'll come back to this. In Genesis 2, there's a second story about the creation of human beings. God forms a human body from dust or earth or clay, and then breathes God's own breath or spirit into it so that it becomes a living soul. The Hebrew word for breath or spirit here is neshama, which can mean wind or breath or spirit. But unlike other Hebrew words for these things, nefesh and ruach, neshama is used only of God and human beings and not of animals. And some of the rabbis regard neshama as the highest part of the soul which can encounter God. For Christians, the verse invites the interpretation that God breathed his own Holy Spirit into the first human, or at least 
that humans were created in such a fashion that God's Spirit can dwell within us, and that this is what God desired and intended from the outset. Indeed, much of our spiritual tradition says that we are only fully what God intended us to be when God's Spirit dwells within us. We are specially made not just for an I-thou relationship with God, but for God to dwell within our hearts. And this, I think, helps us tie together the breath story of Genesis 2 with the image and likeness in Genesis 1. Think of the metaphor of a glove. An empty glove sort of resembles a human hand. It's sort of shaped like a hand. It has spaces for four fingers and a thumb. And empty, it's sort of a flat image of a human hand. But if I put the glove on, now it's much more like a human hand, fully filled out because there is a human hand within it. I'd suggest that similarly, when God dwells within us, filling us out with the Spirit, that is when we are like God, because God himself is literally within us. If God is not within us, then we're more like an empty glove or a balloon that's lost its air. We're still somewhat in the image of God, even though that might be a little distorted, like a rumpled glove, but we're no longer like God because what makes us like God is his presence within us. This is a wonderful and perhaps unique view of human nature as something that is in itself incomplete and longs for completion through union with God. Genesis, however, does not call us God's children. In fact, Christian theology makes a firm distinction between Jesus, who is the Son eternally begotten of the Father, and us and other things which were created rather than begotten. We speak of Jesus as the only begotten Son of the Father and say that he is of one being with the Father, coexistent from before the creation of the world, and we are certainly not that. And, as we shall see later, when the New Testament speaks of us as God's children, it makes us clear that we are not children of God by our nature, as Christ is, but through adoption, through being grafted on to Jesus, the true vine. In Genesis, we're told little of Eden, where human beings walked the earth in close communion with God and as faithful stewards of creation in Genesis. But however we imagine it, it seems little like the world we find us around us today, with all its wars and misery, self-will and exploitation. And the people of that time must have been very different from us and the people around us if they lived close to God and nature without need or conflict or strife. The biblical story about this difference is in Genesis 3, the story of the fall. Adam and Eve freely decided not to listen to God, but to the serpent and to follow their own wills, rejecting God. And we each repeat this primal rejection, preferring our own wills to God's. God loves us and wants to dwell in us, but he does not force himself upon us. When they rejected him, his spirit withdrew, leaving our nature incomplete and no longer in the image of God, like a glove that's forgotten the hand that was meant to fill it. We were left with reason, will, and many desires, but without that inner divine guidance, light, and life, and as a result, human nature as we find it 
is no longer godlike, and even the image of God is incomplete, distorted, diseased. This is the condition we call sinfulness or fallenness, and it is what drives us to commit sins of insisting on our own will, harming ourselves and others. And we cannot change it by ourselves. If what we need is a renewed relationship with God and for God to dwell within us, well, relationship is a two-way street, and both we and God have to cooperate in it. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But it's up to us whether to open the door and let him in. But the whole Bible is a story of a God who is continually reaching out to restore relationship. And the key to how he does so is in taking on our human nature in Jesus Christ, proclaiming the good news, dying and rising again, and calling all people to share his risen life. Yes, this involves forgiveness of sins, which is emphasized in today's readings from Acts and the Gospel. But John's letter tells us that it also involves something more and deeper. This new relationship is described as being adopted as God's own children. That most intimate relationship of parent and child. Now the word adoption does not occur in this passage, but it does appear elsewhere in the New Testament, both in John and in Paul. So I'm not just imposing my own interpretation on it. Uh, to quote one verse in Ephesians 1, we're told that in love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons and presumably daughters as well. And this adoption occurs in our accepting Jesus, who, as Romans 8 tells us, became the firstborn of many brethren. So when John says, we are God's children now, it implies that you and I were not always God's children, even though we were always good creations formed in God's image. It's a relationship we must enter into voluntarily, even if it's God who takes the initiative in offering to adopt us. Now, I find that sometimes people dislike the idea that we're God's children by adoption rather than by our very nature. And I think there are two reasons people sometimes feel this way. One is that it might sound too exclusive. We are God's children, but some other people are not. But the offer of adoption is open to all. God doesn't force anyone to become a member of his family if they refuse, and all we have to do is say yes. Moreover, we don't really know who has done this, perhaps in ways very different from our own. Indeed, the first letter of Peter tells us that Christ also preached the gospel to the dead. And so, as I preached on Good Friday, we have reason to hope that everyone has every chance to hear and receive him. The second reason, I think, is that some people regard being adopted as a child of God as somehow less than being one by nature, a kind of second-rate and less precious relationship. But this misunderstands what a wonderful and precious thing adoption is. If, someone, if you are someone's adopted child, you really are their child, and not in some lesser way than their biological children. In fact, if someone adopted you, they made a special choice to invite you to be a member of their family and to lavish parental love upon you. Adoption is an act of deepest love and an acknowledgement of how precious we already are. And did we not sometimes feel 
like orphans in the world? Did we not sometimes feel the words of that spiritual? Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Being in the world is like being an orphan, maybe in Charles Dickens' London like Oliver Twist. Perhaps we feel there's no one to love and care for us, and we're at the mercy of a dangerous world that we don't have the resources to cope with. That was very much the spirit we find in some of the Greek tragedies. Even the Greek gods are dangerous and capricious and cause much human misery. But our God wishes to become our loving father and to enter into caring relationship with us. Imagine Jesus as someone who goes to the orphanage and out on the streets and says, my father is wonderful and wants to adopt all of you. And we can live together as a large and loving family in his eternal kingdom. Come, follow me and become my brothers and sisters. I could well wish that more evangelism was phrased in such terms. It's true that many are drawn to the good news because they're all too familiar with the bad news of sin and guilt and shame. And a new life freed from these is much to be desired. But others come because they've always had a longing for a divine father to love and complete them and a family of many brothers and sisters. The promise of today's reading assures us of both these things. It also invites us, the already adopted, to go out into the streets and invite others into God's family as our brothers and sisters. Indeed, to invite even those other orphans we may not like, the bullies, the thieves, even the artful dodgers who manipulate people into lives of crime. If we really believe that God wants everyone to become his children, we have to strive to desire this as well and to love and forgive one another. And that isn't always easy. We are God's children now, and so we can cry out, Abba, Father, and know that God hears us as a father hears his children's cries. But John also tells us something more. When we eventually see Jesus face to face, we shall be transformed so as to be like him. We don't know what this will be like, even John didn't know, but it must be something very glorious. The Bible tells us that Christ dwells within us and we in him, and that through this, our nature is already being changed to be like his nature. We're not going to become God the way Christ is God, the second person of the Trinity through whom all things were made and the king of creation. We're not going to be that. But we will, in some fashion we cannot yet understand, become God-like. In modern terms, I like to think of it as something like a transfusion of Christ's spiritual DNA that changes our very nature. Just as the communion elements become one with our bodies, Christ's nature becomes one with our souls. And this is also suggested in my favorite gospel parable, Jesus, the true vine. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me. I only started like, I only started to feel like I understood this when I learned a little bit about vine growing. The vine dresser will graft a sprig from a young grapevine onto another old hardy plant. 
they become one plant. The branch retains its identity, but it's also part of the vine. It gets its life from the vine as we get our spiritual life from Jesus. And here's the remarkable part. The branch is gradually changed at the level of its DNA, taking on some of the nature of the vine. It becomes something different and stronger and better than it was and part of a bigger whole. So it is with their life in Christ. In being grafted onto him, some of his nature becomes part of us and we are eventually transformed into his full image and likeness. We don't become additional Christs, but we become part of the body of Christ. And each part of the body shares something of his nature. Indeed, we become more than sisters and brothers. We become one body, the body of Christ. So these short verses tell us something wonderful and remarkable indeed. We are already adopted as God's own children and are on the road to a resurrection glory beyond our understanding. Lavish love indeed, good news indeed. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen.